Yeah, so it's going to be a bit thin on the ground next week. Cheryl away, John away, Pete and Mary away. Um, I'll be here. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Um, so, it's quite funny how the service has already started unfolding. We've been talking about worship. We've been experiencing worship. We've been going into intercession. And the direction I feel that kind of hit me pretty hard yesterday and and I was reminded of other prophetic words that we've had over five places of church that there's a Davidic grace on this church. What do I mean by that? Like a, a grace to worship, a grace to um, to live a life of worship. So it's not just a I don't mean music. That's a whole other realm. And we talked about that yesterday a little bit. So maybe I'll just go back and just cover that a little bit, just again. Just defining what worship is. Um, quickly, worship is about government. It's not about this. That's praise. Okay? That's good, and that can lead us into worship, but that isn't worship. A worship team isn't worship. In fact, the, the very word worship team I struggle with and I guess I've been so programmed by the church for my whole life that those words are synonymous. We use the word worship team, worship music, worship this, worship that. Um, but how much worship is going on? Often it's praise, often it's technique lessons, often it's practice sessions musically. So we're talking about musicality, we're talking about praise. But are we talking about worship? Worship is an issue of governance. Who is on the throne? Psalm 115 verse 8 is a great place to go about worship because it describes what worship is. In a sense, you become what you worship. So... We want to become like Christ, amen? We're Christians, so we become like him by being in proximity with him. The only way to come into worship, true worship, is to come into proximity. Nearness, closeness, drawing near. So, without lingering on that too much, I'm going to move into the message because time is ticking and I want to talk about Davidic worship. We've all heard the phrase Davidic worship. Oh, that's really Davidic. That's, that's like David. I want a heart like David. There's Davidic worship conferences. There's teaching you can get. But what is Davidic worship? And I, and I believe I might have found an answer in Psalm 56 and Psalm 57. Those two psalms are precious and they begin with a cry that comes from David's heart about mercy, about help, about refuge. So true worship will cost something. Why not? It, it has to cost and so David's life is a picture, and if we look at Psalm 56 and Psalm 57, we see two separate streams of this testing in David's life. Psalm 56 is speaking of the Philistines coming into his life and causing him grief. Psalm 57 is speaking of Saul. Now it's not explicit, you've got to look into this and, and read it, but I won't say Saul is beating up David in Psalm 57, and I won't say the Philistines are beating me up in Psalm 56. But if you read it and you listen and look at the poetry and the imagery that David is, is expressing, we're seeing two separate streams coming into David's world. One a Philistine one and one a Saul one, which are imagery for the world being Philistines, the pressures from this life, the society that we live in, the world, 
And then we've got the other stream that's coming into his life of persecution, which is Saul, one of his own, from the house of Israel. Could be the church, religious organizations. Can we imagine being persecuted by our own people? Yes. <laughs> if you've been around for five minutes, as a believer, you've probably experienced persecution from your own brothers and sisters which God allows, and God allowed into David's life. So who has been prayed over saying, um, I see a Davidic worship over your life. I see David's heart. Anybody in this room ever had that kind of a prayer? Yeah, there's a few hands there. There's a few outside the room I know as well that have had that same prayer. And so if we have this kind of a prophetic word over our lives, then we need to understand more of it. And I think it's an important um, truth to come to. This is a, a prophetic vision that's been prayed over, prophesied, even before Fireplace began. We had the same calling, this Davidic calling over this church. And so we need to understand it. And it's taken three years to come to this, so um, it's not instant. But I believe God in this season is starting to open up. And Cheryl and I were just talking about the school of ministry that we're coming to in this next season. We're going to be talking about this kind of thing, Davidic worship. So David was known as a man after God's own heart. Acts 13. There's your verse. Acts 13. It says, After removing Saul, he made David their king. This is speaking of God. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want. That needs to be our testimony. I have found Lucy, a woman after my own heart. I have found Andrew. I have found Tim. I have found Kim. Amen. Amen. We talked yesterday about true worshippers, that the Father in John 4 is looking for true worshippers, those who would worship in spirit and truth. He's not looking for true musicians or true singers or true albums. <laughs> the Christian music scene doesn't need another album. Amen. We need true worshippers. And so there's a distinction if we see that Jesus Christ himself was saying that my father is looking for true worshippers. There's a distinction now that there must be some false, something other than true. And so that's a check in my heart going, what am I doing? Is what I'm doing, is that true? I need to be testing, I need to be looking at my own life and going, is what I'm doing true? And we see the beginnings of this with Cain and Abel in Genesis. Abel had a heart of true worship, didn't he? He bought the fat of the animal. He bought the lamb, the best of the herd, the firstborn, the best, fattest. We look at fat nowadays, don't we, as something that's negative. <laughs> <laughs> but fat in God's economy is a beautiful thing it speaks of rest the animal was in a place of growth and rest and comfort it had been shepherded correctly it had been loved on it had been nurtured it had the best grass amen so fatness is something God loves. It's a healthy thing. Cain, on the other hand, offered something that was unacceptable. He was a farmer. I believe these two boys had a choice. Now, this isn't in Scripture, but this is just... Go, go there for a moment with me. Spare me. 
some license here. But I believe those two boys had a choice of what they wanted to do. One chose tilling the ground and the other one cho chose something that I believe was a higher level. Seemingly lower in a lot of people's vision and, and ideas of what is good, but one chose to be pastoral, a shepherd, one that would get around the lambs, the animals, the herd. Isolation, loneliness, pouring one's life out for others. The other one, Cain, was a doer. His name means to acquire. You look at the Hebrew word for Cain, it means to acquire, it means to gather, it's a producer, it's one that's doing. It's that Martha thing. We can do and do and do and do and miss out on the rest, the fat, the waiting, the resting, the pouring our lives over and into others, shepherding. This is what society pushes so hard. The do, the do, the do. Over time. No days off. Can you stay back? The do, the do, the do. But not this. This is lowly. This isn't esteemed at all. I believe there's a rest that comes with true worship. As worship begins to wane in individuals' lives, and I've seen it in my own life <clears throat> over the course of 48 years of being a believer, backsliding, getting on fire for God, and then backsliding, back on fire for God, and then you know, gradual backslide again. Every time a beginning of a, of a backsliding phase would happen, it happened when worship stopped. When worship began to cease in my life, in my personal <coughs> prayer time where I would stop worshipping God, the decline would come. A heartlessness would come. A callousness. And we see the same in the nations. Let's look at Germany. Germany started off with a reformation. Oh my goodness, that was wild. Luther. What a crazy place that Germany was. Great Christian foundations. And what happened at the end of 1945, the slaughtering of God's people, a waning, a self-reliance, a, a, a self-sufficiency came into that nation knocking at the door. It's the same knock that Cain had on his door. Sin was, was lying at your door. God warned Cain, sin will lie at your door. Knock, 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 continuing unrepentant, find it overtakes him, and what does he do? Kills his brother. We will kill our brothers and sisters if we allow sin to lie at the door. Am I my brother's keeper? To even say that back to a holy God is insolent at the, at the least. Whenever man stops acknowledging God as his immediate and ultimate provider, self-sufficiency awaits. We can provide for ourselves. And musicians are guilty of being able to put a show on. Get up there, play chords, rehearse all the parts, put on a show, and never touch God. <laughs> Done it been there, guilty. I've even been to conferences to teach you how to do that. They won't say it overtly, but they will give you all the techniques and all the tips, but none of it is pointing to Christ. None of it is pointing to Jesus.
talking to the students at school six months ago or something, we talked about another temptation that creeps up into our midst with this area of Christian doing, and that's the wanting to get out there and do something for God. We get fired up, zeal comes, we have some revelation, God gives us downloads, we get understanding, we now are learning scripture, we can apply interpretation of scripture, we've got some experiences to tell, we've got some stories, we've got some testimonies, and now we're ready. <laughs> we're ready to go out there and do it and start taking the world for God, start doing something for God. This is a this is a scary place to be when we start becoming self sufficient, wanting to do something, thinking we have something. That's not a bad thing. And it says in Timothy, um, those who desire um, to be a bishop desire a noble thing. New King James Version. So it's good to desire ministry and good to desire and help. It's a noble thing. But the key thing is that you are sent. The key thing is, is that God has created a way. He is the one that is calling you and he is the one that is promoting. It says in Proverbs that it's God who lifts up kings and brings princes to nothing. God will bring people up. And God will come and find us. So come back to Davidic worship. David was found in the field. He was oblivious to what was going on, I believe. And God came and found him and made him king of Israel. Moses was in the back of the desert. In the back blocks, hidden, 40 years. And God manages to find Moses. So I want to remind us all that God will find you, okay? Don't rush out and get business cards. I know you don't do that already, but this is going out on video as well. Don't rush out there and try and promote yourself. Um, I was somewhere recently where people were handing me business cards, telling about their ministry, things that they do, and trying to network. That's a worldly thing. I was grieved that this person who named himself as a pastor was out handing business cards out, trying to network, trying to get people together, trying to get his name known. I'm thinking, what are you doing? This is not the time or the place for that. And you're trying to promote yourself. Let, let the Holy Spirit, he will promote in due time. Amen. He will find us. So let's go to Psalm 56. I'll just touch on this quickly. Down in verse 3, David talks about when I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. This is a good thing to know. Because a lot of Christians go, oh, I don't have any fear. I'm not in fear. No, brother, I'm free from fear. Really? <laughs> King David said, when I'm afraid, I trust in you. And he's dealing with people that are trying to kill him. You're dealing with somebody who might not like something you posted on Facebook. You're dealing with somebody who might rebuke you for being late at work. And you think that's, that's persecution. You might be cut off at the lights. You might be ripped off in the shop. David's got people chasing him, trying to kill him. And he says, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. So today, I want us to just muse on those thoughts and, and those words that David uses. It's okay in Davidic worship to be afraid. I release you to be afraid, okay? <laughs> but to trust in your Redeemer like David did. To trust in God. There are times that we come to 
peaks and troughs, decision times in our lives where, we've, where we're afraid, do we go right, do we go left, do I go straight, do I stop, what do I do? There's a sense of fear there, and there's a healthy fear as well. But I trust in God. David always inquired of God. That's something I loved about David's life. He always inquired of God. He always went and sought God's advice and counsel. Go down to verse 8. This is what I want to, want to come to. Verse 8 says, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. I've always loved that. I've always, whenever I've read the psalm, I've always gone, oh my goodness, how precious is that? That God knows my wanderings. In King James, it says, knows my tossings. So tossing and turning in bed, restlessness, you know that, you go to bed and you just can't sleep. There's stuff going on. You know there's something in the heavenlies going on. There's probably warfare going on over your life and you can't sleep. You're restless. God remembers and he knows and he records all those things. Every tear has been stored up, has been caught up. Why would God do that? Why would God want to keep David's tears? Is he losing his marbles writing this stuff? Is this, a, is this just poetic mumbo-jumbo? Or is there something deeper? It's, a, I believe, a statement of God's fastidious care and attention to an individual's life. He cares about every single one to the point that every tear is accumulated, is kept, is caught, is recorded. All the tossings and the turnings, all the pain, all the suffering. Davidic worship is a journey of persecution. Again, that doesn't preach well, but to, for anything to be worth something, it must be tested, it must be proven. It actually pleases God that would be tested. And to be tested means some resistance. Amen. Can you still worship when the person across the pew has ripped you off, still owes you 200 bucks, or said something mean about you, or didn't, didn't esteem you, or didn't send you a birthday gift, or whatever? Can you still bring your offering to the altar? with a pure heart of forgiveness and softness. Just thinking about David's life. If he is that attentive and that careful about David, how much more about you and I? especially in this end of this age now where we're at. I want to explain just quickly for a close why, why these things are recorded. Why would God keep this stuff? And it's because of the word recompense. Whatever we do for God, and what we do in the name of God, for Him, is precious. There's times when you have done things, you have served for God, and you've been ignored, you've been overlooked, you've been persecuted, you've come into sickness. There's a recompense that's been stored up. We're doing things here on this earth, and in the spiritual realm, the unseen realm, crowns, jewels, things have been stored up for you. Every time that you're serving God through
persecution, through suffering, and for his name. God is keeping a record. Amen? I've written here, those who are stripped will be rewarded. You will take your stripping with joy because you know what's coming. Amen? The Lord Jesus Christ knew what was coming on the other end of the cross and he was able to endure it and I know you guys can endure it too, by the Spirit of Christ in you. So I'm sharing a word It's a little difficult to swallow. Divided worship, you know, we think it's playing in a 10,000 piece band. I mean, that's how I've heard it preached. Oh yeah, David had 10,000 drummers and 5,000 whatevers and 20,000 that and blah, 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 all these singers. And that's Davidic worship, amen. Take up the offering, let's go home. But I want to say that it's something a little bit different. I want to say to you that true Davidic worship is the life of David. The life of David was the life of being chased around by Philistines, being chased by Saul, someone he esteemed, admired, loved, had served. but he kept a good heart. There's a key word in these psalms, actually in both psalms, that is phrased trampling. And I know some of you feel like you've been trampled. David himself said, I've been trampled all day long. Now, I don't think that's the literal people walking all over David all day long, but it feels like that. Life feels like that. Church, ministry, family, work, the world feels like a trampling. I just want to remind you that it's okay. It's not forever. It's a time of provenness. It's a time of stretching. It's a time of testing. We just had somebody who turned 40. The, the number 40 speaks to testing and trial. Provenness. It's a sign. This is a time we're coming into of increased suffering, increased persecution. The church is going to come under more and more persecution. Another good advert for Christianity. (laughs) But there's hope in this and there's a future and it's only for a season. Ultimately, we're going to come to the end of the age. Seven years of persecution. The last three and a half are going to be more severe than has ever been on the earth, ever. And we may be lucky enough to live in it. There's a teaching out there that says that you'll be caught up before any of that happens. But I just want to remind you that that's not what the Lord Jesus preached. So we'll come to that another day. In this world you'll have persecution, he said. In this world there'll be suffering. But be of good cheer, I have overcome. The intense suffering that this age is coming to is a once and for all. It's finite. We're on this timeline together, guys, and we're coming to this. He's going to come back with a shout, the last trumpet. And then, eternal joy. No more tears, no more suffering. Amen? We're coming to an end. This is final. We're coming to a final time, a final day. Again, churches generally don't preach this stuff. But we need to know it. We need to know that the suffering and the pain that we're we're all going through at various levels, 
It's coming to an ultimacy. It's coming. And then that's it. You're on holiday. <laughs> the rest of eternity. <laughs> Amen. Verse 8, Psalm 56. We'll look at Psalm 57 another time. You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because God is for me. In God I will praise his word. In the Lord I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? It says in Proverbs that the spirit of man sustains him, even in sickness. So your spirit can't be touched. This, we're talking about spiritual things, not outward things. So the world can pull your fingernails out. <laughs> they, can, they can hang you, they can shoot you, they can chop bits off, but they cannot touch your spirit. Amen? A believer does not need to be afraid. Jesus said that, didn't he, in, um, in Matthew. He said, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but be afraid of one who can kill both the body and the soul in hell. When I read that verse in 1999, I was set free from huge amounts of fear of man. Because I'm not to be afraid of man, I'm to be afraid of the Father, to be afraid of God in a healthy way. I'm not talking rattling and freaking out every day. But having a healthy fear of God will free you from the fear of man, of persecution, of torture, of trial, of rejection. want to speak to some hearts here who feel that they are ignored even by God. That God's silence is not his disapproval. God's silence, even in your heart right now, is a test. It's a trial. Do you still trust me? Do you still lean on me? Thank you, Father. Father, I pray for this same spirit that was on Abel, this shepherding heart, the heart of Davidic worship, this heart of caring for others, shepherding others, bringing the best of the herd, coming into true worship. Romans 12. Father, I pray, God, for this true worship to arise in our hearts. Lord, I pray for your light to come and expose areas of, of our lives that that are Cain-like, that want to do, that want to produce, that have that itch that has to be scratched to be seen, to be heard, to be doing something. God, it's innate in, in the heart of mankind. Lord, I want to repent of that right now in Jesus' name. Lord, on behalf of this fellowship, and my own life and family, Lord, I pray.
pray for the season that we're coming into of looking deeper into true worship, Davidic worship. Lord, I thank you for the invitations from other churches to minister in this area and and connections coming. Lord, that you're drawing hearts together. Lord, I pray for a, a unity, Lord, even in our own midst, in this area of truth. to intervene God in our lives Lord it's for a purpose there's something that's serving a higher purpose Lord I pray for comfort to get around hearts right now Lord that are feeling isolated, that are feeling left out that are feeling exposed Holy Spirit, comfort, I pray right now that you would come. Bind up wounds, I pray, in Jesus' name. And Lord, may true worship arise, Lord, in the midst of these things, or that we can still speak your name, we can still lift our voices Open our mouths wide. Thank you, Father. Amen. Awesome. I might speak more about this next time, maybe next week. Could we just get around the communion table at the